the Orbital Commando, Crisis on Europa, written by Ben Shadow. Chapter 1, Martian War. 1705 hours, March 3rd, 2187 military calendar. Olympus City, Terraform Research and Development Center, Southwest Section B2 Northwest, Olympus Mons Mountain, Planet Mars. Martian sand sifted through Joe's legs like a small flowing stream. It reminded him of the biodomes he would find within his home city of Olympus. As the distant Martian winds picked up from the echoing sandstorm, brewing from the mountainous region of Thoresis Montes, 1,200 kilometers northwest off from his position, he couldn't help himself watch the nearby sandstorm and hearing the distant gunfire echoing nearby. Powerful emotions flooded his thoughts for a moment. He knew it was coming from his home city of Olympus. His training kicked in and remained calm. As a professional soldier and member of a special unit, the Orbital Commandos, it was easy to grief and present his anger and pain, but after recent events back on Europa, he didn't know if he wanted to use those types of emotions in front of his team or give away their position to the recently discovered alien forces, the Falgolians. He knew he had something unlike anything to the human race, but he remained vigilant and focused on the task at hand. But it reminded him of his childhood, while playing with his little brother in the long tall grass of the large domed city. Joe sighed and then smiled. Happy times, he said to himself. I'll find you again, little bro. Just hold on, I'm coming, I promise. He watched over the distant Martian surroundings, the Martian wind echoing nearby. Joe upped his magnification to 10 times on his helmet's heads-up display and watched the brewing storm getting stronger and larger at the same time. This is about to become a problem, he thought to himself. If that storm continues to intensify, we'll have a problem with Exfil for sure. He went on to one knee and unslung his tactical long-ranged Type 47 energy actuated rifle. An energy rifle built in with a special application scoped rifle. Joe enhanced his magnification to 20 times magnification on his scope's computerized targeting system and began to scan across the Martian landscape. Thanks to his tritium-powered, illuminated his sniper's scope, and that meant Joe was able to see his targets in low-light combat. So, this is Mars, a familiar voice echoed through the comm static. Commander Alexander Ivanov appeared onto Joe's small video feed on his helmet's left-hand side of his heads-up display, showing his only Alexander's on helmet cam. It's nice to know that the Martian world is flourishing with full of life. Alexander said sarcastically. His Jovian Russian accent would occasionally sometimes tend to a little difficult to understand at times. But at least Joe spent enough time to help him to understand Alexander what he says with a strong Jovian accent. At its better than some, Joe always thought to himself, from former teammate rival to a good friend and teammate. Well, at least we're good at keeping up with our dedication. Joe chuckled. How's the x feel looking? Joe asked whilst looking at Alexander on his heads-up display. Alexander looked down and sighed. Long but your entry of Exfil is closing fast. Alexander looked up and towards his helmet's heads-up display. If soon as possible, I'd highly recommend getting out of there before they swarm Y location, Alexander replied with concern. Copy that. Give us an update if anything happens, Joe said. Will Komoi drug? Translated into English, my friend, Alexander nodded on the video comm and his video feed disappeared off his heads-up display. Joe sighed but focused on the mission at hand. The dusty Martian terrain seemed to be almost disappearing from view at this rate. Joe had to act, or he and his team won't be able to make it to Exfil in time. Especially with all of the wounded inside the research facility's medial center. Joe continued monitor more on the growing sandstorm again, with his long-range Type 47 energy-actuated rifle with a built-in standard special application scoped rifle. He switched to his infrared sight on his built-in computerized scope and enhanced his vision of his computerized scope to almost full. 
Joe began to survey the distant horizon of the Martian landscape. The far-off distant Martian sandstorm seemed like it was unusually still. Joe enhanced more on his sniper rifle's scope to full. His visual view was also improved by his helmet's heads-up display. He peered into his scope's point of view again. What the? Joe muttered and monitored his visual of the storm. There's somehow movement within in the storm war barrier. How is that even possible? Joe whispered to himself in surprise. That's impossible, he thought to himself. Martian storms this time of year are violent in nature with wind speeds of 106 kilometers per hour. These Martian sandstorms are supposed to be extremely dangerous around this time of year. He paused and quickly peeked above his rifle's computerized scope and checked for any incoming movement nearby overhead or under his current position. He then continued to scope more of the surrounding area with his scope's computerized sight until something else caught his attention again. Joe frequently rechecked his scope's computerized visuals again on his Type 47's computerized display again. Only this time, it was the same results on his infrared sensors. Same results again. But only this time, there are much larger ground-based objects. Tanks, Joe thought to himself. Or are they troop transportation vehicles? Quickly realizing that the alien invaders were about to breach from the consistently growing superstorm. Whatever's protecting them from the storm's powerful winds seemed to be extremely impressive engineering from a distance. Joe enhanced more on his computerized scope magnification to full again and then got his answer. Eight-legged mechanical all-terrain looking spider tactical combat walkers slowly marching out of the increasingly more violent storm barrier. Beside them marched out the hundreds of thousands of organized rows of Falgolians fitted with powered vacuum-rated combat armor, similar to the human-rated spacesuits that even Joe uses on the field or in deep space. Not only his suit features camouflage combat utilities that are worn under the armor, but also part of the armor. Joe's suit has a digitized camouflage patterns depending on the environment, including all gray fatigues, earther woodland camouflage, urban camouflage, and winter camouflage. Joe has his suit digitized as the designated Martian camouflage. Either way, these, these large reptilian-looking soldiers or seemingly stalking centurions with powerful built-in combat energy swords on their lower arms. These Falgolian foot soldiers, protected by their large mechanical walking tanks, shielding them from the hostile weather. Joe's helmet heads a display zoom feature that allowed him to tag any targets and to identify locations. Joe quickly realized they might have only one shot of getting off home or risk getting killed off by those alien bastards. Joe knew there were probably more than a few hundred, thousand of them coming out of the sandstorm itself and his long-ranged motion sensors were off the scale. A massive army this size must be coming to finish the job or something else. Either way, something that all Martians would never stand for. Losing Mars to these alien bastards would be devastating but some who live outside of Mars's borders would be considered all lost to the alien onslaught. But for the Martians, however, this fight is personal and would not stop until every last of his kind falls. Like the ancient Greek Spartan warriors back on Earth in Monopoly, they give their lives to protect their country and their king in glorious battle. Martians too would grow fond of their Spartan legacy as powerful warriors to only protect Mars and only Mars alone. But to Joe and like his recently passed father, Lieutenant Colonel William Harrison, a legendary naval pilot and rifleman veteran of the Jovian Wars, believed that there is more to it than meets the eye. Judging from the tactics of the alien attackers, rather than just achieving global dominance, they were just exterminating all human sovereignty off the face of the Martian surface. Joe's father wasn't always around when he and his brother was growing up, but it definitely gave Joe some purpose to find some comfort in his life to see his father again. His mother was also a naval commander in the Martian military. Her combat experience made her a formidable opponent in the heat of combat. Joe's father, however, was originally from Earth, who was stationed on Mars to support military efforts and operations in and outside of the Martian borders. Eventually, Harrison met Joe's mother during his military leave and eventually having been settled as an Earther Martian on Mars. Joe's father originated from the Earther home world, but recently sent and stationed to Mars as a UN commander to provide protection to both planets. Eventually, Harrison met Joe's mother and settled down on Mars. 
but as predicted by the UN and Martian governments, war finally came to the system. The outer planets demanded a complete secession from the interplanetary governments. And soon he had to go fight for the future of the alliance of Mars and Earth. Joe was only a boy when the war finally arrived on Mars. The heavy fighting was left consumed in some of its Martian cities by the Jovians' planetary bombardments. Joe remembered the conflict and worrying about if he would have ever saw his father again. After a few months of heavy resistance from the Jovians, the Martians eventually pushed the aggressive Jovian invaders back into space. Soon enough, his father came home from the conflict. Joe was relieved that his father was still safe. But at the same time, he knew that the United Nations and the Federation needed newer options and the Council of Inner Planets was established. Joe's father became one of the new military council advisors. After a long and hard debate between the two planets, a new military solution was established. One that his father helped led to stop all future conflicts within in the solar system and became a legend to all in the following future. One that even now dedicates himself to continue his father's legacy. Leading a highly advanced soldiers, the orbital commando, Back then, soldiers struggled to stay on their feet during to firing their weapons in space. Whereas the commandos were future soldiers of humanity's future interests, and to which hopefully a future of stabilized peace. An orbital commando has newer and far better state-of-the-art technology in today's military history. Thruster packs for quicker resistance from weapons pushing them away into space or in low gravity. The list went on. Joe continued his father's legacy as being an orbital commando because he was proud to be his son that helped stop the sudden ceasefire back on Ceres, back in the belt. After the war ended, Joe's father became chief military advisor amongst the council, and Joe since then never got to see his father that much since. So Joe joined the military and someday serve under his father's military future operations. Joe never had to join the military, but due to family, he had to find his way in life, and the Martian military was just the place that he needed that found his new purpose. But Joe never realized the responsibilities of what was coming for him in the end. Joe watched his father issue the airstrike over his last known position. Thousands of Fargolians flooded the area, and once Joe was clear of the strike zone, Joe saw sacrificing himself for Joe's future of his life a couple hours before. Joe wanted to grieve, but he couldn't, because he was in a severe combat situation. Joe wanted to cry, but being vulnerable now in a combat environment, would make him mentally unstable to deal with the situation. Unfortunately, Joe didn't have much choice and locked away his grieving emotions and prepared for his next move. Being trapped halfway up the largest extinct shield volcano isn't all just fun and games. The local mountain tram service systems are severely damaged from the frequent bombardments from the Falgolian Martian battlefields that ravaged on below and above the mountain ranges. In other words, no ground reinforcements because they're either dead or fighting in more defensive areas. But to Joe needs to get these people out of here. No matter the cost, it would bring him or his team. Either way, something had to be done. Martian sand continued to sift past his long-range Type 47 energy-actuated rifle's barrel, and eventually the sand from the storm caught up with his scopes. Visibility. He looked away from his scope's view. Sergeant. Sarah said over the radio comm. You need to see this. Joe paused for a moment and continuously watched the distant sandstorm nearby. Looks like the storm covered Theresis Montez from the naked eye as well. That's how you know it's a bad storm. This concerned him. How could a storm this large prevent all off-world evacuations and combat an enemy larger than Mars itself seemed almost impossible? Joe pushed himself back up and swung back on his long-range Type 47 energy rifle and headed back towards the nearest airlock. Copy. I'm on my way, Joe replied on the radio comm. Distant alien machinery echoed nearby, a sound that almost haunted Joe for hours. He turned away from the airlock, the sun reflecting into his helmet's visor. He scanned the area with his inferred system, thanks to his helmet's heads-up display and zoom features built into his helmet's computerized systems. This allows him to tag nearby targets and identify locations from far off distances. With the help of his built-in infrared sensors in his helmet's heads-up display, he can swap between both visuals of tactical infrared cameras and night vision, all built into his helmet systems. Without this technology, he wouldn't have the capability to see any heat signatures or any low-light combatants nearby. 
Joe double-checked his inferred sensors for any signs of movement nearby from his known position. Nothing, thank God, he thought to himself, but kept his fingers on his C-16 suppressed automatic machine gun pistol. Something wasn't right, he thought to himself, and opened the building's automated airlock and entered. Joe expected ambush at any time, so he needed to be cautious. The airlock doors closed behind him. A red light dimmed over him as a klaxon wailed loudly, echoing the room as oxygen filled the room. A green light flickered on the console, indicating the all-clear signal. Joe took off his oxygen-compressed helmet and the airlock's klaxon wailed loudly again. The airlock doors in front of him opened and stepped into the large scientific lab in front of him. The whole room was filled with a dozen hunkered down civilians. Some of them were even badly injured with a mixture of combat marines. Men and women who survived the first few hours of the invasion had scars on their faces and serious plasma burns all over their bodies. Joe glanced across the room and saw hundreds of combat medics assisting the wounded, civilians and soldiers across the room. It was a bloody mess, and he knew it. Guilt fed across his all emotions. No one needed to suffer something this barbaric. He then noticed Sarah and Ashleya standing around a holo table filled with plugged-in wires and damaged communication devices. Several rugged military laptops, tablets and handhelds devices filled the holo table's interior. A deep space satellite revealing a live broadcasting of a map across Martian surface. It was a tactical map, Joe thought. Live images of the large volcanic Olympus Mons mountain and its city down below. He noticed a dozen of friend or foe signatures, or FFS for short, indicating the blue dots as the native Martian forces and allied forces stationed on the planet, and a dozen thousand red, indicating the hostile alien attackers. Joe watched them from afar and marched over towards them, almost walking into a combat medic. He heard Sarah and Ashley having a heated debate. Eventually, Joe approached them. What's the situation? He asked the both of them. Both Sarah and Ashley are turned away from the holo table and looked towards Joe. Our forces were able to hold off the incoming attack in the southeast of Olympus. Ashley said, however, feeling hesitant. They won't be able to hold them off for long, Sarah continued. Joe trained his eyes onto the holo map. How long have we got? Joe asked, sensing a concern between them. Ashley looked down in despair and sighed, we estimate less than a few hours at least, Ashley replied. After looked up and giving Joe eye contact, Joe sighed fuck as he whispered to himself and began searching more for a tactical solution. There must be another way to get these civilians off world. He searched for thousands of them on the map. None of them, at least on Mars, would be able to help them get out of this situation, not in time at least. Some of them were close but not close enough for a dozen unmovable wounded. Joe glanced over the plasma-damaged communications equipment and put down his helmet onto the holo table in front of him. We've been trying, Ashley replied, but with all of this broken equipment. She continued, it's been, she paused for a moment, trying to find her words, rather challenging. Frustration and disappointment filled Joe's vision. This isn't good enough, Corporal, and you fucking well know it, Joe replied. There are people out there dying moments away from our very position. He continued, we need Xville now. Joe then turned towards Sarah, his second in command. Is there any more electrical equipment other than this crap? Joe asked. We did, Sarah replied, but there wasn't many. Sarah put of disorganized wires on top of the holo table and replaced the gapit with an old mid 21st century civilian radio. Fortunately, we were able to find this in a glass cabinet, and one of the survivors of this facility said it was still functioning. Sarah sighed, feeling frustrated, exhausted. But however, only just barely. Well, it's good enough. Good work, Joe replied. Let's get this wired up to this console and boost a signal, though. Sarah watched Joe while he concentrated. He connected the old electrical wire to the holo table's console tuned it on, Radio static hissed and crackled constantly. Joe reprogrammed the radio's frequency a dozen times to get a signal. 30 minutes went by, and Sarah saw more and more Joe's frustration build. She placed her hand onto his shoulder. Joe gently turned towards her and smiled. We'll get through this, Joe, I promise. Joe looked her, 
I know, and I hope so too, he replied. Joe then continued tuning more into the mid-21st century radio and another for a tactical solution on the hollow table's holographic displays. Sarah continued watching Joe while he scrolled through thousands of tactical solutions for Xfil, and frustration was beginning to fill more of his concentration. She knew he was exhausted. They all were. But Joe knew that if he didn't find something soon and quickly, the fate of his team and all of the injured civilians won't be able to escape the incoming onslaught. Something has to be done, and Joe knew that if these tactical solutions aren't as helpful, then he'd had to go for more dangerous solution, something to save his team and the civilians from more serious harm. 1,912 hours, March 3rd, 21, 87 military calendar. Olympus City, Terraform Research and Development Center, Southwest Section B2 Northwest, Olympus Mons Mountain, Planet Mars. Joe grew weary of the time and knew that this could very be the end. Sarah watched him nearby and picked up a small glass and placed it under the dispenser. She selected the water icon and poured out some water into the glass. She walked back to Joe and passed over a glass of fresh water to him. We're running out of time, Joe said. They'll completely surround this area by nightfall, Joe said concerned. Sarah walked over to him from afar and embraced him and kissed his left cheek. Remember what they've taught us in the academy, Sarah replied. Joe looked up after searching through dozens of tactical data from the Jovian Wars. Machines break, but our minds don't. Sarah was right, but he'd had to figure out a way to get he and team with the other wounded. Out of here or the alien attackers would immediately swarm their entire location.